happened was is we, uh, uh, as part of a learning and teaching group at our school, uh, we run inset days. Uh, and we had a recent one, obviously, with the big drive in literacy uh, to do it in, uh, in school as well and make sure that across all the curricular areas uh, that we were obviously getting literacy uh, embedded quite well. And we had a really great discussion on the day in our department and we, we came up with loads of ideas. But as usual, I, I want to go this a little step bigger. So um, I went to Twitter and collaborated probably with eight or nine teachers, uh, many of them uh, who've presented tonight, like Ben Leonard, Mr. Mac P.E., uh, John Tate himself, Mr. Wickens. Uh, and we came together and we put together um, a blog post uh, which is on my um, my blog at the moment, uh, where we actually started looking at um, ways that we in PE could actually embed literacy in our lessons as well. So it's not just going to be um, a bolt-on, but actually it is part of the way that we're delivering our lessons as well. Um, so I'm going to go through some ideas that we've taken from that list. Most of these are ideas that um, I'm using in my lessons myself, because obviously I'm using them, I can talk more about them. Um, but I've just posted a link to uh, the Literacy P document. We've had thousands of hits on it, um, so it might, might be worth uh, having a look through when you have time to do so. Um, so here we go. We're going to go through some um, one today. Um, theory lessons uh, are, are the biggest thing which I've been developing this year. So I've got three ideas for theory, uh, two ideas to use in practical, and then one obviously is a culture for your department to try and get more and more people uh, or more students uh, within your department, trying to make your department a flagship for literacy within your school. Um, so let's go through them. Uh, the first one was introduced to me by uh, Darren Mead. He's on uh, Twitter. He's an absolutely fantastic teacher, uh, well worth following. Um, now, he talked to me uh, a little while ago about something called uh, Fact and Fiction Writing Task. Now, he is a, um, uh, a science teacher, and he's the one that showed me how to use this as part of the solar taxonomy sort of idea. Now, pretty much involves uh, in your theory lessons. Um, getting students to demonstrate a really deep understanding of, of a topic and a subject. And it's a really great way of getting students to actually uh, engross in the subject that way. Um, it, it's also really good for um, getting away from just like, the basic learning, such as things like remembering definitions and understanding and stuff. Um, but it's absolutely brilliant to obviously to get students up to creating and applying and evaluated, uh, which is the top end of, of uh, deep thinking. Um, so what you need to do if you're going to do a fact and fiction task is as follows. You need to pick your topic. Um, so I've got some examples on our blog where we were looking at um, one was a muscular one, one was a skeletal one. Um, and then what I did then is I then taught the topic in my subject, as you do within the classroom. Um, then I got myself uh, sat down and I picked out some of the key points that I taught on that lesson. And obviously that the specification needs me to teach for that particular uh, subject or topic. And then I wrote myself an opening story. Um, and this is really good, actually. It's really good for you to actually do it yourself. Um, so I wrote a story, and as you can see, uh, it's called The Revision Nightmare, uh, and I talked about uh, a student who, um, you're at home obviously revising, and a student phones you or texts you up saying that, um, he's really struggling about tomorrow's exam, uh, and he wants to know a little bit more about um, a particular topic on the skeletal system, which he can't remember. Um, he asks if he can come round, and you're a little bit reluctant for him to come round, and so on. And it gets all the way to the end, and this guy called Dan finally knocks on your door, comes round and says, look, I really can't remember anything about the skeletal system. And that's where you finish your story. Then you go on to the next bit, and at the bottom of the sheet, it then says your task to, is to complete the story um, and actually help Dan actually start um, talking about the skeletal system. So in your story, you're going to be teaching Dan um, how you obviously do the skeletal system, all, all, the, all the facts and figures about it. Now, a fact and fiction task is really good because as students go along, they need to underline as many facts that they use within that um, fact and fiction task as possible. So in the skeletal system, when they're talking about the three different types of joints, when they're talking about different uh, types of bones, the functions of the skeleton, and so on, they underline those words in their story, whether it's a written story or a script. Um, underneath them as well, at the bottom, next to the ticks, I've actually got on there some, um, some key aspects which the students in that topic need to include in their story. And that's really, really good because the students then obviously can read through, right, in my story, needs to talk about the functions of the skeleton, and then they can talk about in their story how they help Dan and how they talk to him and that sort of thing. Um, and obviously the things in there like the different types of joints and the connective tissues and that sort of thing, and they can include it in their story. So here's an example of one that my students did by a, a guy in my class called Owen, and it was amazing. Um, he picked up the story where I finished off. Dan was obviously sat in front of him in his room, and he went through the criteria, which I left at the bottom, and he then obviously underlined all the words, talking about involuntary muscles. This is actually one about muscular system, sorry. And he's talking about the involuntary muscles. Uh, he's talking about the cardiac muscles, biceps, triceps, abduction, adduction, all within his story and again how he's trying to link it in so a fact and fiction task is absolutely brilliant i've already put the link um actually i'll put the link on in a minute uh, for you to have a look through as well because i've got it on my blog as well 
um, and it, it's, it's well worth obviously looking at and I use that as part of solo taxonomy as well um, with my students and uh, again just for the fact that um, teaching uh, or doing a bit of homework or classwork like that is so much more interesting than getting students just to list facts and, and answer exam questions and stuff and it's just a real deep understanding. Uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is articles. Now, uh, I've just recently done a big PBL project uh, where I've looked at cycling and sport, and I brought in uh, five topics from the GCC subject, like sponsorship, um, and started thinking about um, media and sport and so on. And during this project, um, it was really important that I got articles really, really involved in my lessons. Now, predominantly before that, I would use uh, a few YouTube clips. Um, maybe I'd use a little bit of uh, the textbooks and that sort of stuff. But because of this literacy project, which I did, the PBL project and so on, I really started getting uh, loads of articles into my lessons. Us blog, and we linked all the articles that we uh, used in the lessons um, so that students could go back to them and use them as much as possible. Um, and like I said, it was really, really good in lessons um, for our projects and as part of the literacy to use these, um, like I said, in your lessons, because students then learn new key specific terminology. Um, they, they learn in new insights into the sports. When you're actually talking about sponsorship and you've got an article on sponsorship and we use a cycling one, students really get an understanding. They really get an insight to actually, with the interviews and the quotes that are in this article, about actually how sponsorship is real life and how difficult it is for some people to get it. And obviously how people like Rory McIlroy end up getting huge night um, contracts, whereas some women cyclists get hardly anything. So uh, using articles in your lessons is absolutely fantastic. And I really recommend whatever subject you're teaching tomorrow or next week, to try and get yourself some subjects, uh, articles in your lessons to, to really sort of um, to develop it. Um, and there we go. Uh, part of it, obviously, as we were doing it, we were analysing the topics as well. So I had a, a nice sort of framework which students use. And as they were reading the articles, we pulled out the key topics and terminology and had key glossaries and stuff. So it was reinforcing the content which I was teaching as they were using the articles to do it. Another one with, uh, I looked at um, is we have on our AQA specs some eight mark questions, some long answer scenarios. Um, and I use something called the IDEA method to answer them because students were terrible at answering them. Uh, in an eight mark question, a lot of them were getting two or three marks. Now, it's a writing frame, very easily, and students literally go through the IDEA process two or three times, okay? So in a scenario question, if it asks you to talk about sponsorship in sport or let's talk about technology in sport, students will identify two or three technological advancements in sport and then they work through the IDEA process. So the first thing you need to do is identify um, what it is um, that they're going to be talking about. So maybe they're talking about the pressure pads in swimming. They need to then describe what it is. Um, then they explain what it is. And then obviously they link it to a, a real life athlete. So uh, an example of a one which my students just done at the moment, again, was a technology and sport question. Um, on the, the I for the identify, they identified that um, uh, a facility. And they talked about different facilities that athletes use. Then they described obviously why a facility is a te technological advancement. And they started talking about a velodrome then explained about the velodrome and obviously how that as a facility really helps world-class athletes and then they linked it to a real-life person and talked about how Chris Hoy and so on actually um, used it as well. Yes, it can be used for 12 mark AS questions um, because it's just a very simple, obvious thing. Um, with the eight mark questions we use, students have to talk about two or three particular points and going through this process, identifying it, describing it, explaining it and applying it to a sport and then doing it for the second point and then maybe for a third point is absolutely fantastic and it's a really, really good way of, of developing their answers. Um, and there we go, there's a sheet there, the sheet there. So identify, describe, explain and analyze. And students do it that way um, and then I put a model question at the end so the students can see what it actually looks like when you put it all together in full. I'm going to look at some practical ones now, um, try and get a little bit of speed up here. Um, First of all, uh, literacy and our practical. Um, first thing that we really look at is verbal literacy. Obviously, our students are talking quite a lot when we're getting them to evaluate and improve or analyse performance. Um, so what we do is we actually really spend a lot of time uh, talking to students about how to develop their verbal literacy and actually give proper feedback and actually not just say, yeah, it was good, but actually start to develop. So we've come up with these little crit uh, critique sheets um, about how well they're given the feedback. And pretty much all it says is, how do I give it? What do I say? There's a success criteria there. Um, now you have two choices, tell them verbally or show them visually uh, and then what else could you use to give really good feedback and the students use these to structure the way they're giving feedbacks and lessons and obviously when we compare them against some of our self-assessment sheets for evaluating and improving, uh, students can then really see how well they're developing uh, the way of using their verbal uh, literacy uh, in our lessons. I also send out two things as well, one at the bottom of your screen is called a learning spy. 
Uh, and whenever we're doing a feedback session, normally my non-kitters, um, uh, there's not many of them at our school, we're quite good with this, but with occasion we've got an injured person or a non-participant who hasn't got a kit for the lesson, I turn them into a learning spy and I get them to go around and analyse all the feedback. And they go around with the clipboard and the pen, and when people are given feedback, they get the pen and paper out and they make comments of what they hear people saying. And if they hear somebody saying it's good, they write it down in the bad column. And when they hear somebody say, I like the way you extended your arm and made connection with the shuttle, they write that down. They go back to the board and they write it on the board. And then when I stop the group, bring them in and discuss how well we've been doing and have a little reflection session. I then go, right, learning spies, over to you. And then they look at the board of all their notes they made and go, right, I've had some people say that you've been saying it's good, it's bad, we've got to get rid of that. And some students have been going around and saying really detailed feedback, that's a lot better. And the fact that these students are role modeling, that they're looking for this effective feedback is fantastic. Another one is having feedback triads. And that's where in your three, one person gives the feedback, one person's receiving the feedback, and one person's got his clipboard and pen, and they write down the feedback. So then afterwards, you've got a nice reflection sheet there. And then there's a class, you can come back together and say, oh, what did you say? And it's written down. Okay, and as a class, you can discuss how it goes because some students forget what you've been told them about five minutes ago. So a nice sort of feedback triad it is really, really good. Uh, literacy keywords in my lessons, very simple. Um, because literacy is so highlighted now, uh, I really went through our schemes of work and through the things I had to teach, and I just picked out the key literacy words I needed to use uh, in things like gymnastics and football and badminton. And on my board, I literally just split up the uh, the board as simple as that. I have my learning objectives, my success criteria, maybe a technique side. I have my keywords on the right hand side, three or four of them, and I ensure that A, I make sure I discuss them and, de uh, and develop their knowledge within the class using these four new words, or when we're given feedback or students have to answer questions, I make sure that those four things are included in their feedback as well. So they've really learned four new words and are using them in the correct context in my lessons. Um, the last one I'm going to talk about is very, very simple, and this is just a way of, like I said, uh, making your department the flagship literacy. Um, uh, department in the school. Um, for four, uh, I must be about two or three years actually, we had uh, a, a, a sports media team working in our department uh, and they developed something called the Brookfield Sports Newspaper. All printed out, we had a number of reporters that went round, um, they uh, went to our fixtures, they went to some of our clubs, every time we had a rock challenge they advertised it and they came together once uh, a week uh, in our IT room and they brought together uh, our Brookfield sport with the content to lot, great photographers and everything. We handed them out uh, outside the PE office in the library, uh, behind the main hall and everything, and it really, really went well until the budget cuts came in. And obviously, it was um, it's not cost effective to do it that way. Um, Westfield PE department, as you see on the screen, obviously, when we collaborated, uh, they shared theirs. Uh, they've developed their own sports media team, and they do it as a blog. Um, it's absolutely fantastic, again. Um, there is no reason why just us as PE teachers have to be just condemned to being just practical uh, specialists. You know, there's so much scope in our lessons and the media team within your group um, it is so fantastic. Led by one PE teacher, getting a group of journalists, a group of students to be photographers. You set up the blog uh, and then once a week, just get into an IT room and get them to put it together and share it with the school. And if your school's got a Twitter feed um, where somebody centrally sent it out to parents and stuff, um, then get this put on there as well. Share it with parents share it with the community, and actually start getting the stuff that you're doing within your school uh, really, really well, okay? Um, I'm David Fawcett, 27. Uh, please have a look at my blog. Um, there is so much on there that we're looking at solo taxonomy, PBL, lots of literary stuff on there. And like I said, there's about 50 ideas on there, collaborated from about 10 different teachers. So get on there if you can, have a little look, and uh, see what's there. And I might actually quickly just put my link on just one more time uh, so you can see the post, and you can read through it and get some of the ideas. Uh...